Mm, mm, mm. Oh, y'all really gonna love me for this one. Y'all gonna love me for this one. Okay, I can hear it now. But I got you. I got you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the mental house with me, your host, Khadija. All right, family. I've been waiting to do this series for such a long time. A lot of y'all know, um, we've been talking about this for a long time. Sexuality. In the church, sexuality. In life, sexuality. In schools. And um, I think some groups said it better best when they said, let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me, baby. Sex and me, baby. I will pause this. But I gotta finish this story, so let me go on right ahead and get to it. The case of the Reverend James Cleveland may best epitomize the magnitude of the silence in terms of homosexuality in gay church, in the church. Christopher Harris certainly feels this way. When he was 13, Harris was the only boy alto in the choir at Cleveland's Los Angeles church. He was a strapping six feet tall and looked 20. Cleveland was a giant in the music industry. He wrote more than 400 songs, recorded more than 100 albums, 16 of them gold and won four Grammys. He had founded the Gospel Music Workshop of America and mentored a young Aretha Franklin. Okay? Now, with that being said, you guys, when he died in 1991 at the age of 59, 6,000 people attended his funeral. Harris is then 25 was now 25 and has HIV. It is It has its moments, he said, but mostly it doesn't affect me unless there's stress, said Harris, who is Cleveland's former, also his former foster son. Harris once went by the name of Christopher Cleveland. That was before he filed suit against Cleveland's estate, alleging five years of sexual contact that ended with Harris testing positive for HIV. Did y'all hear me? Because I want to make sure I made that plain. Uh, a lot of y'all act like y'all don't know nothing about it. So I want to make sure we discuss this in a mature way. Because it is only through the deception, it is only through the hypocrisy, and it is only through shame that people feel a need to lie about who they are and they pull crap like this. Okay? Now, he legally, he said, I became his. And that's what he said in a, television, in a, a telephone interview from his home in Los Angeles. The case was settled out of court. The terms prohibit him from discussing the settlement. But he is free to discuss his life with James Cleveland. Okay. I went to his church. He looked into my face and saw my dreams and he used it. I wanted to sing. I didn't want to be like him. He promised that he would help me. He just played it to his advantage. He used my naiveness to his game, Harris said. Y'all hear it? Oh, I know a whole bunch of pastors like this, and a whole bunch of y'all do too, but you're going to play like you don't. You're going to play like it's an isolated incident, and then when they start talking about the Catholic priests and the little boys, you want to act like you don't, you know, like it's an isolated incident that just is only in the Catholic church. Quit lying. One of my best friends told me his first experience was with the deacon in the church or the pastor one. Or both was his earliest recollect recollections of sex. The same people 
who put you out turn you out. That's what Sylvester said. Y'all know Sylvester. You make me feel mighty real. You make me feel mighty real. <laughs> Y'all remember old Sylvester? Okay. That's what he said. Same people that turned me out, put me out. And that's how this hypocrisy game goes when it comes to church and homosexuality. Okay? Or people in same sex or gender loving uh, relationships. Okay? Harris said his sexual encounters with older with the older singer were not molestation. Nor, he said, were they his first such encounters with a man. He says that they were typical of the secretive lifestyle of many of people to whom he was exposed. People in Cleveland's inner circle knew. People at church knew. But they pretended that it didn't exist. I guess what you don't see, you can't say. But I can. No, he didn't die of heart failure. Heart failure is just a delusion, Harris said, nearly laughing. And he hesitated. Let's just leave it at that. But he didn't die of no heart failure. What makes the black gospel community one of the last bastions stations to confront the 13-year-old AIDS epidemic, y'all know what it is now, is its vibrant yet underground homosexual subculture. First of all, they denied that the homosex they denied the homosexuality. Then if something else like AIDS comes along with it and haven't dealt with the first part of it, so of course they can't deal with this. You would think that there would be more compassion. They are very, very sad and cruel. Behind their backs from some of the pulpits, gays are called punk, sissies, and even girlfriends. We sing their songs and shout and get happy off their music, but condemn them privately, said the Reverend Yvette Flunder, former, legal, former lead singer of the Walter Hawkins Love Center Church of Oakland, California. Such pejorative attitudes, say critics within the community, are behind and silenced that the musicians and choirs appearing at AIDS benefits for other affected communities but hold paltry a few for their own. I've been on the air for over 17 years and not once has anybody approached me about doing an AIDS announcement of religious program to support or benefit, said George Witcher, host of TCI's Cable Gospel Expression show and the manager of Jay Caldwell and the Gospel Ambassadors. Understanding the nature of our business, the good news never condone homosexuality or sexual promiscuity of things that perpetuate the outbreak of the disease, said Reverend Mitchell Taylor, director of the promotions for Savoy Records, the oldest traditional gospel label, and like the sick part is, you will never see an AIDS uh, uh, a foundation program or a charity event in the church uh, regarding all the fallen soldiers who died of AIDS. Why you don't see that in the church? Why you see it in the outside world? Uh, and, but there's no love and no compassion in the gospel world for artists and pastors and deacons and all the rest of them and, and ministers' wives and organ players or whatever who die of AIDS. Why isn't there any kind of charity or any kind of recognition um, of their lives? It said, um, this, according to this article, article, that's why you don't see benefits because it's almost like it's sanctioning it. Uh, Flunder's concert in San Francisco, which drew the titans of Billboard magazine gospel music chart, 
was a rarity because it included acknowledgement of those singing were among those dying. When more than 1,300 gospel music lovers attend a gospel AIDS benefit at Tindley Temple United Methodist Church in Philadelphia, they were treated to performance by some of the finest names in the regional and national gospel music. Tony Award winner Melba Moore and gospel veteran Dorothy Norwood were among the performers who lauded uh, their audience for supporting AIDS Action Day. Philadelphia's largest volunteer-based AIDS organization. But throughout the five hours of singing, dancing, and clapping, no one from any of the 12 choirs got beyond the generic admon admonition that no one is immune from this disease to acknowledge that they had lost members to the disease as recently as this year. The only group to publicly return its performing fee was the Wilmington Chess Mass Choir. Alan Bell, publisher of BLK, a Los Angeles-based magazine for lesbian and gay African Americans, said the record companies are in the best position to uh, uh, financially to establish a fund for a community that it has richly mined. The silence often makes black gospel community AIDS patients put off seeking medical treatment. They go off in seclusion, just like a sick animal or something, said one of Wilmington's minister who denies persistent rumors about the nature of his own health problems. As a matter of fact, you heard of the term a loner? That's where they come from. That's what they become. And they are ashamed to go to places that provide help. Blunder calls these people church burned. She sees them when they come for classes and services offered by the Ark of Refuge, an agency she founded in San Francisco to provide housing, education, training, and care partners for HIV AIDS patients. Blunder said that she has a harder time convincing churchgoers with AIDS to seek health care than other AIDS patients. When they come for services, they usually already have full-blown AIDS. Very often, these are men who grew up perfecting three-part harmonies in high school and church choirs. Men like Gary Cooper, a personal attendant to gospel legend Sally Martin, and a protege of Cleveland and Thomas A. Dorsey, the father of gospel music. He didn't hang out in the, on the corners. He didn't go around taking folks out of their classes so they could go to rehearsal. I mean, he would go around taking folks out of their classes so they could go to rehearsal. Uh, Judith Cooper of Chicago said of her late son, being stereotyped as an AIDS pastor and as an AIDS choir is a growing concern. That's why some choirs require prospective members to supply a letter certifying church membership and a recommendation from a pastor. Some go as far as rejecting tenors with short crop hairstyles, studded fingernails, and too much body swishing to avoid stereotypes of being a gay choir. Bobby Jones, host of a syndicated gospel program, watched by more than 4 million viewers each Sunday, speculates that James Cleveland's career might have been ruined if followers had believed that he was HIV positive. Bobby Jones, Bobby Jones also acknowledged uh, some viewers may be watching his Sunday program to see which choir director is losing weight Yet only once has a musician said on the air that his sickness was due to AIDS. That was Judith Cooper's son. It was during a gospel explosion concert in Barbados that more than two years ago that Gregory Cooper, a musician in Jones's choir, talked about the disease. It made front page news there the next morning. Then he did it on my show in the United States, and people have prayed for him, said Jones, who presided over Cooper's funeral in Nashville. 
after his backup singers and local uh, choirs, after his backup singers and local choirs performed at the funeral, Jones invited Judith Cooper to speak. She introduced Nashville hospice workers as an aid volunteer who ended the funeral by talking about methods and rates of transmission of the disease. That was my idea, Cooper said proudly. And a very rare one at that, said Reverend Hobbs, who advocates turning gospel concerts into forms for AIDS education. Delaware's Tracy Shine says she feels ready to break her silence at solo concerts and address the issue. I'm bursting inside. We're making our lives short by not talking about it. And, um, I think that's a good start. I think it's very important that we acknowledge that this um, phenomenon of hypocrisy has last has lasted way too long. This cycle of ignorance has been portrayed way too long. Uh, if you're supposed to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, then you got to enter his courts with thanksgiving. And honor him with praise. And I think all God requires of us is that we love one another. Nothing more, nothing less. And that you want for your brother what you want for yourself. Which in turn means do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These... Um, Truth postures are very real, and they should be practiced as deities. I don't know, well, that's just my opinion. What y'all think about the hypocrisy in the church? You know, and a choir sings on uh, what I said about James Cleveland, because, you know, it, you know it's, it's really interesting how, how this works, you know. It, it really is how they continue to remain silent and keep people uh, perpetually un, uh, unable to live in their truth. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think about it. If you like what you hear, like, subscribe, and share. Please leave your comment. And um, I'll be back in the next video.